So this is just an update of what I presented a little bit early last year. So, but this year um, we have some results to show of what the first actually we are going on. Uh, briefly, just for some introduction, you know, uh, most of you know this very well. Uh, aflatoxin, you know, in contamination in corn is caused by a member of aspartic section flavors, and of which, you know, uh, uh, F flavors is one of them, you know, like L and S, you know, paracyricus, nomias, and I don't. But of this, uh, you know, uh, I don't know what they can see the point here. So, the most important ones are appear to be anomias, you know, parasiticas as well as well. And this just a picture showing, you know, uh, molding or not even here of corn. Uh, stress factors such as, you know, temperature and the damage uh, during our uh, rain formation actually does influence that uh, contamination. And after touching contamination, you know, in rain it has major problems, you know, that very well, you know, it affects formation of aflatoxin, you know, uh, carcinogenic compounds. And also in Africa, you know, uh, you know children that have been fed to corn meal that has aflatoxin in it, does actually have poor involvement of antibiotics. And so it's very clear that, you know, uh, we need to take care of the problems. And then of course, in corn that has more than 20 parts per day, it's normally rejected uh, because of that. Uh, this is just one of my favorite pictures. I always like carrying it around just to show the effects of aflatoxin uh, you know, in chicken. Uh, here you have a, a very a chicken, that has, a liver from a chicken that was fed to corn that has no aflatoxin. It looks very nice and healthy. But as you increase the dose of the amount of aflatoxin in the meal, you, know, you see the liver cirrhosis and the damage that's happening with the uh, chicken meal itself. And then, of course, as far as management is concerned, you know, there are several uh, management options that are available out there. Some of them have been discussed this morning, including uh, cultural practices, for example, using clay, and, uh, and of course, agronomic factors. You know, we have efforts that are being geared towards breeding, you know, improving breeding uh, resistance, doctor of contamination. And then, of course, we have biocontrol. You know, uh, this is just one of those uh, uh, procedures that are going to be used to uh, do that. So my focus this morning is going to be focusing on enhancing uh, biocontrol of uh, the toxin contamination reduction. As many of you know that uh, members of section flavor, you know, they are highly variable in terms of their toxin production. You know, we have those that produce you know, uh, no toxin at all, detoxigenics, and those that produce toxin. And as far as uh, F levels is concerned, we have L and X. You know, L, uh, most of all the biocontrol that you have belong to air. Uh, those that produce the toxin and those that don't. We have the um, uh, S strains, you know, uh, in North Carolina and Georgia, we don't have those ones here. We've not seen those ones yet. And we have a silica that, that has produced both B and G. So you have a wide range of uh, toxin to that. But we know that there's a lot of variability. It's this variability in toxin production that makes it possible to use biocontrol because uh, you can actually apply the toxic atoxidative strains to uh, displace the toxin producers and sort of uh, change the population towards uh, atoxidative. And by doing that, you're actually reducing the amount of toxin that's going to be in the corn. And so right now, it's just a picture just showing uh, that I, from some of my slides that I had, you know, we have on the right hand side, we have an atoxygenic strain, and the left hand side, we have an atoxygenic strain. So the goal is to sort of apply more of this atoxygenics and uh, be able to uh, sort of uh, cover you know, the infection costs with the atoxygenics to the extent that you have very little uh, atoxygenic strains getting in to uh, form the, uh, the toxin. So as far as uh, commercial products are concerned, in, uh, in, uh, in the United States, we have Aflagard and AF36, and recent now we have uh, Aflasafe in Africa. And as I indicated earlier last year, Aflasafe is actually a combination of uh, four uh, atoxygenic strains. Uh, based on what uh, observations uh, in Africa and here in North Carolina, we have seen that uh, biocontrol agents, there's a lot of variability in terms of uh, their performance. You know, uh, for example, Aflagard uh, does better when it's applied in North Carolina compared to when it's applied in Georgia. And so due to that variability, you know, we really don't we want to find out okay, what's really happening. You know, uh, why is it, for example, uh, Aflagard does better when applied in North Carolina compared to when it's applied in Georgia? 
and uh, is it because of something in the soil that is actually influencing this? Because the only difference there is the location. So is something in the soil sort of you know uh, responsible for this difference in the efficacy of the biocontrol? And so our uh, hypothesis therefore was that you know uh, if we match uh, the uh, biocontrol agent to the uh, population in the soil genetically to be similar, then you can actually enhance the efficacy of biocontrol. In other words, if the biocontrol agent is similar to what's in the soil, then it will likely, like if we go competitive, it will actually uh, um, perform much better. And so we set out to actually test this hypothesis in three steps. So our objective therefore was to see, determine the impact of the, uh, the genetic structure of A flavors, a special section of flavor in the soil, and to see to what extent uh, that composition does influence after stopping contamination in corn, and whether we can actually use this information to sort of provide some general, general information as far as in which areas, you know, where a particular biocontrol do better than the other. So we did these experiments in 2012, 2013. Last year when I was here, I didn't have a lot of information in terms of the, uh, the data, but now I have some good data to share with you guys. So the experiments were done in Georgia, in North Carolina, and as, as well as Alabama, and we used a single uh, 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 maize hybrid that is actually, that performs uh, very well across the three uh, states. So we did the planting, uh, it's a randomized complete block design, we had different treatments of Aflagard, uh, uh, according to the recommendation grants, and then as, as well as uh, uh, F6. However, in, in Georgia and Alabama, we were not allowed to apply the F6 because of, uh, we didn't have a permit to do that. So we only did the Afrogard uh, F6 comparison only in North Carolina. So, um, so we did uh, do a couple of things. First, you know, prior to application of the biocontrol, we actually collected soil samples in a diagonal. Uh, best, just as a map showing uh, the field in, in North Carolina. So we have 20 sites, so we had GIS coordinates for these sites in the field, collected samples from each of those sites and then bagged them separately. Uh, and then we put markers to this particular point so that we can actually go back and collect samples of soils after the biocondor has been applied and then the harvest. So because we wanted to also look at how the temporal uh, changes occur in terms of the species that actually we get of course, uh, the different uh, 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 correlate that to what we are seeing in terms of the toxin information. So this is just a map sh uh, showing the uh, application of the various treatments uh, of F36 and Aflacard in North Carolina where we can actually apply uh, both. So at the end of it, you know, uh, at harvest, you know, we harvest the corn, you know, of course, we turn down the toxin uh, content within the uh, kernels. So this is a picture of some of the results uh, of the fields in uh, 2012 and 2013 in Rocky Mountain, North Carolina. Uh, this is just the stage of the corn uh, when uh, the pre plant the pre control the soil samples are actually collected. Uh, this is just when uh, the after one week or two weeks after the biocontrol was applied, and then at harvest, close to harvest, we applied the uh, we sample the soil. Uh, this is. Uh, uh, Mary Lewis, the graduate student who is actually working on this particular project. And then there's just some of the images showing some of the insect damage as well as the morning that was observed in the field. Uh, so, the first thing that we did, because we wanted to see uh, what's there before we apply the biocontrol, because we, uh, we sampled the soil pre application of the biocontrol. Of course, we got a lot of section flavor in the soil. And then, uh, besides section flavor, we also got uh, uh, different strains, you know, uh, section 9 we also in the soil. So we had a lot of a bunch of stuff that actually uh, we observed in the, in the soil samples. And then of course, uh, the next thing that we did, of course, is to determine uh, what we have in the soil. So it takes a while, most of you know, how hard it is, especially from soil samples, to be able to really get good colonies, to count whether you have parasitic as L or S, it takes a while to do that. So there's a lot of logical variation in terms of what we actually can see. And so we use the 5-2 media to be able to separate the individual section of level. And so this is just a picture of showing the uh, L, L, F, L, L. Uh, as far as flavors L. Uh, 
uh, on the bio media. You know, uh, for the most part, you know, as indicated, you know, the health streams are you know, producing nice sclerosia. Nice sclerosia, and actually, they are normally very few. I'm just a picture showing uh, uh, on the 5 2 media. And then, we, this is a picture showing the end, uh, the flavors S uh, on the uh, on the uh, 5 2 media. Most of the time, the S produces the smallest sclerosia, but they're normally numerous. Actually, you can do it two times and times of them. And this is a picture of showing the uh, aspergillus basilicus on the final two medium. So using this particular medium, we could actually uh, distinguish uh, various, uh, whatever it is, S or L or basilicus in our collection. So uh, this summer, looking at some of the results in North Carolina in, in 2012. So looking at what happened at the pre-biocontrol, uh, uh, post-biocontrol, as well as at harvest. So this uh, pie chart looks at, uh, let's describe the composition of, of the various section flavors within the soil that we obtained pre biocontrol application. And for the most part, 86% of what we observed were air spray, the flowers there, uh, before uh, the biocontrol was actually applied. And then about 14% uh, of those belong to apex uh, So we didn't obtain any S yeah, within our collection. And then as, after applying the biocontrol, the, the aspergillus uh, flavors air actually increased dramatically from 86 all the way to about 97%. And the parasiticus levels actually fell down considerably to about 20%. And then at harvest, almost everything we obtained was aspergillus uh, flavors air. So there was no parasiticus here. So basically in North Carolina, the only two strains that we observed were a flavors air and parasiticus, but actually that variation yeah, is not very surprising because you're applying a lot of air flavors in the soil, so the air harvest is not surprising that you have 100% uh, flavors there. Yeah. And so you have this graph, you know, temporal shift you know, towards uh, uh, air flavors air as you actually start from the pre control as well as going on to harvest. So this is very encouraging because most people are always wondering when you apply the biocontrol, is this still there or does it disappear? So people are always wanting to see that. So I'm going to show some of that information uh, in depth to you. Then, as far as gen genotyping is concerned, you know, we used three genetic markers. You know, we used uh, F F17. Uh, F17 is, uh, is, is uh, actually a microsatellite OSI. It's actually very useful for determining more recent uh, haplotypes. And then we used MF, MFS. MFS is actually uh, is adjusted to the aflatoxin gene cluster, and then uh, TRIPC gene, which is actually important as far as independent assessment is concerned during meiosis. And based on the previous study that have been conducted you know, uh, at NC State, we can actually group you know, our members of section of flavor in three distinct uh, lineages. And we have the A1, basically includes those you know, aflatoxin that produce both uh, uh, aflatoxin as far as CPA. And 1B are those that produce, don't produce aflatoxin, and also they don't produce uh, CPA. And this is the clade which uh, Africa belongs to. And then the 1C is uh, those that uh, pro don't produce the aflatoxin but produce CPA. And this is the clade to which uh, F36 belongs to. And this is just a, a, a general image just showing uh, some of the uh, pictures for what we got from the FRIPC uh, gene uh, using the ladder here. Uh, Side, on the right hand side. So, uh, as to looking at the uh, at some of the results that we obtained, you know, um, and just for comparison purposes, I just decided to show the pre biocontrol application you know, uh, for all the three states just to see what's really happening across the individual states. Um, so, if you look at Georgia, for example, uh, about 87% uh, you know, of the haplotype of all trade were actually did belong to either the haplotype. Or the F6 uh, uh, clade. And then the one that belonged to um, uh, the F36 clade was about, uh, I think, 3%. And the one that belonged to the uh, 1B, which is the Aflagat clade, was about uh, 10%. But if you look at uh, Alabama, you, know, you find that uh, the haplotype the that belonged to the uh, Aflagat clade increased dramatically to about uh, uh, 36%. But the F36 clade, which is 1C, was about uh, comparable, about 
And then if you look at North Carolina, you know, most of those that were up there belong to the Africa clip, which is which was about 48%. But also interesting to notice here that the uh, F36 clade, you know, the haplotype that actually belonged to it was still the same, about 4%. So we can see here from uh, this particular three states that, you know, there's actually the highest the haplotype clade was actually in North Carolina and the lowest was actually in Georgia. But the F36 clade did not change much, it's just a matter of the same, about 3 to 4%. And so if you look at the uh, locations of these fields within uh, the map, so these are just the latitude and longitude here, you know, uh, you find that there's actually this uh, lat uh, latitudinal effect. As you increase the latitude, as you go up north, you know, you have more and more of the uh, African clade showing up. And of course, as you move down, you have more, more uh, a little bit of uh, uh, F that's showing up. So in general, the, the one big clade is actually increasing as you increase the latitude. So this is something that was uh, we were able to see uh, in our results. All right. So um, so how does when you apply the uh, the biocontrol you know, before or after you know how does the haplotype distribution change? You know, uh, is it any different? So we wanted to really look at that. And some of this pie chart here there is actually going to show that. So I'm just showing the results for 2012 for North Carolina as uh, that we were able to show. So um, this just uh, the distribution of the, of the various haplotypes. You know, uh, this is just similar to what was shown there before, but this is actually the people pre biocontrol application. So about 48% belong to the Afnagat clade, and then about 3% belong to the AF36 clade. And then, of course, 36, the uh, remaining 48 were others. Remember, these others are basically uh, may include just a single haplotype. You know, they are numerous, but they, are, they don't have a lot of individuals in there. So, but if they add them up, they look like there are so many, but they might just include one single haplotype. So it's really good to remember that. So, so after the applied application of the biocontrol agent, you find that up to 56% you know, of what we obtained was actually uh, uh, from the, the one big clay, which is the Afghan clay. And then the, about 10% of those were actually belong to the F36 clay. And then at harvest, of course, it increased more. You have more than what, whatever you're getting back belonging to the one big clade. And about 5 plus 5, 4 to 5% belong to the F36 clade. And so what's interesting here is to note that, of course, you know, people have always asked, if you apply the biocontrol area, what's happening to that? Does it disappear or are you able to get it back? And at least here we're able to see you can still get back, you know, uh, what we get, what we apply, the African clade, at least we can actually get that back. But, uh, I just wanted to mention here that the, uh, the AF36 clade uh, post biocontrol looks about 10 percent. You know, this, I think, my, my own opinion, I think it's not really changing much. This, should, there's no much difference between statistically between uh, the values of AF36 clade you know, between uh, five, ten, and say four percent. They look pretty much consistent across the board. And so you will notice here that you know that lineage of AB of one B, which is the the Afghan, you know, our lineage is actually increasing, uh, increasing, you know, after applying the biocontrol, which is not shouldn't be very uh, surprising. All right. So one of the things that we wanted to do is that okay, uh, we want to match uh, the biocontrol to specific regions so that you know we can actually see to what extent we can reduce the Afghans in contamination. So what I did is just I decided to put a table together, you know, to summarize what I'm saying and sort of put in the most important information. So the first column here represents the states, the various states, North Carolina, Alabama, and Georgia. And then we have the, uh, the next column represents the biocontrol uh, agent that was actually applied, F36 for Africa. And remember, I indicated that because of the permit issues, we were not able to test uh, F36 in Alabama as well as Georgia. So it was only that in North Carolina. And then, of course, the, the next, the third, column we just represent the treatment, whether you have, it was treated or whether it was not treated. And then we have the aflatoxin amounts. And then we have the last column that represents the dominant clade that was actually observed uh, in, the, uh, in that particular location. So we can see that actually in North Carolina, this is a summary of the, uh, the untreated control had about uh, 103 you know, parts per billion compared to 2.75 uh, for where uh, Africa was applied, or 4.75 uh, 
where AFS is applied. So the amount of toxins uh, in the grain where the biocomp is applied is significantly higher than where it was not applied. Okay. And so the amount of toxin was actually smaller, significantly smaller where the biocomp was applied and in the non-control plot. But you'll notice here that the difference uh, between the uh, AF36 and Aplaga, you know, you know, statistically was not because you only have 4.75 where AF36 was applied compared to 2.75 where Aplaga was actually applied. Although uh, the uh, the the under control in high levels of contamination. So, in my own opinion, I think you know, although those differences are not significant, I think if you have a, you know re, you know in areas where you have higher you know, conditions that are favorable for African toxic contamination, you will actually see much better separation between those two uh, biocontrol agents. And then the corresponding uh, dominant biocontrol agent there was uh, 1B. In Alabama, you know, there's no difference between the control as far as the untreated, although the, uh, the uh, treated, the treated uh, plots had much, much lower, you know, uh, uh, contamination compared to the untreated, but it was not significantly different. And then in Georgia, you know, there, uh, there was no toxin that was actually not collected in 24. So it's good to remember here in Alabama, although, although there are no differences, you have higher levels of contamination in the untreated versus treated plot. And the dominant mean at the was actually 1B. So we can actually, uh, this is not, the data right now is not really exhaustive, but I think in 2013, once we actually finish analyzing and putting everything together, we'll have a much better idea of actually how the different effects relate to our toxicity reduction uh, in different locations. But what's more important here is that, you know, uh, you know uh, where Africa was expected to do much better, that is actually did better. You know, I think that's what's more important. But in Georgia, where we have both, you know, uh, the uh, clay is actually occurring probably at the same frequency. I think either F36 or Alpha that can actually still probably do a much better job. So in, in summary, you know, we, we, we actually show that you know, uh, in uh, North Carolina and in Georgia, for example, we don't have S, we have L and A parasiticas, you know, the most predominant being our F levels L. And then of course there's a, a shift towards you know uh, more of F levels L as, as after the biocondo has actually been applied. And then the dominant haplot, haplot, you know, the haplot, uh, haplotype, you know, depending on where the location is actually being uh, examined, in North Carolina and Alabama, the dominant one is the one big click you know, uh, to which uh, Africa belongs to. And then um, the frequencies of 1B and 1C clades were actually almost similar yeah, in Georgia. And so in those areas, we expect that if you apply the um, AF36 for Africa, I think any of them can actually do a better job. And then, of course, we saw the latitude uh, effect, whereby, you know, as we, the latitude actually increased from the south to north, you know, we have more of the the one big clay actually being more predominant compared to the uh, the one C clay. And then, of course, after that, you know, we could, you know, uh, it's likely to do better, you know, where the in locations whereby the one big clay is actually more predominant uh, compared to the one C uh, clay. And then, of course, you know, uh, you know sort of matching the biocontrol agent to uh, specific locations uh, where the predominant clade is actually going to be in their favor is actually useful for biocontrol. It's actually going to make biocontrol more effective and it's actually more sustainable way of actually doing the work just to make uh, the biocontrol more uh, effective, giving it a better hand to do a much better job. You know? And so uh, this is one of the reasons we're trying to do this is just to be able to give the biocontrol agent, I mean, an upper hand in terms of actually using toxic formation, making it more competitive. So by knowing uh, which composition is actually in the soil and targeting the biocontrol to be able to match that particular region should be able to actually improve the efficacy of biocontrol. Okay, okay just some acknowledgement. I wish to thank a number of people. My graduate student, uh, Mary Lewis, who has been working in tons and tons of places trying to support the place and it has been very good at doing that. And then of course Dr. Cabon and Bruce Horn of Georgia who have been helping us with the phenotyping and phenotyping work. And then uh, uh, undergraduates in Barbara and Seth have been working diligently in the lab of course. And Greg O'Brien, you know, the lab manager of Dr. Payne. And then of course funding from AMCO that has made this work possible. Thank you very much.
Questions? Uh, on your slides back there, you were showing the percentages of AF-36, of uh, AFLAGARD, and other. Did you apply all of those in the same field when you pull those samples? I mean, how, what does that tell me? I mean, was that a composite of samples? I mean, what, what was... What, what, what did that tell me? Okay, uh, let me show you the field, how we have this one applied. I think that's much easier to see that. Okay, so this is the map. So this is the, uh, the, the uh, plot where actually the treatments are applied. So we have, we had about five, uh, six treatments, you know, so these are applied. Uh, you know, we have the Aflaga treatments and then we have the uh, 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 F36 treatments and then we have the untreated control. So, and, yeah. But, but I think so I'm how far they are apart from each other? You, you took all of the soil samples, right. blended them together, and then made that composite. No, we are working, we, we have 20 subsamples in each plot, right. in each treatment. So we are looking at each individual because we want to see what's happening in each individual location. So we are actually keeping track for all those 20 points. So this data is actually a summary you know, of, of those individual 20 points. We can actually, I don't have the slide now, we can actually show you what's happening in each particular plot and point in time. Yeah. So it's actually a lot. Yeah. Around how you had, if you had applied one product in one and one product over here, how you wound up with that slide that had the percentages. I think what it's saying is, it's that lineage, it isn't that particular isolate or strand. Oh, okay. It's got that CPA, aflatoxin combination, right? Yeah, yes, yes. Oh, okay. yeah, it's, it's the lineage because we grouped all the isolates that we got, we grouped them in the individual you know, lineages after sequencing. We can tell this one belongs to B, this one belongs to C, and that kind of stuff. Regardless of what it was saying. Okay. It's speculated biologically why the speculate. Well, I mean, I think that's a very good question. I mean, we have seen this, you know, looking at the latitudinal effects, whereby I think it has to do something with, with either temperature, you know, or, you know, the, the kind of perhaps uh, environmental conditions that actually probably, you know, are operating in that particular region. As you move up north, you know, it gets a little bit cooler, perhaps, you know, and then you have, uh, you know, you know the, the cycles of which, you know, in terms of what's really happening is probably a little bit different with what's happening down here in the north, in the south. And also, if you look at the, uh, uh, probably the diversity in terms of what's being produced, it's probably might be an answer. I don't have a correct answer to that, so. But, but I, I think it has to do with the temperature effects, you know, uh, you know what, what's really happening there, so. Uh, as I remember, Bruce Horn did a study of the transect across the U.S., and that's where he got that right. ECG 24, I think. But uh, have you looked at that data to see if, I think all of those were fairly far north Louisiana and further west, I, I think is where he went. And I'm trying to remember where, where he found ECG 24, what the frequency was there. That, yeah, we, we, we actually did that. We actually did that. The only problem we have is that we have so many gaps in between and to, to really tell what's really happening because we did, you know, because between Alabama and Georgia, this is, there's a very big space there that we don't have. And in Alabama, I mean, Georgia to North Carolina, we don't have anything in between there too. But what you're seeing in terms of the frequency match what you saw because he said that as he moves up north, he's sampling more of the 1B than the 1C. And the same thing is also what we are seeing here. And what I think is probably happening is that there's some, some, something of the either ecological fitness or some favorable uh, environmental factor that actually is making uh, 1B much more predominant uh, as you move up north uh, uh, than when you move down south. Or it might be other factors that are based on either the 
the first genotypes that are being that are planted over there that make it more favorable. That we don't know. For those of you that are doing this, these are basically haplotypes, individual belonging to that particular lineage. So, based on our markers, what we're seeing is more of that lineage of Africa. Does so that make sense? Repetitive use, do you, do you think that possibly that strain would be high enough that you would have to apply it? Well, that's what you're going to see, because this is 2012 data, so we're going to see go back to 2013 and see the pre biocontrol application and see. How many, how much of those lineages in terms of the numbers are still matching up with what was there at the harvest? So we will have a very complete picture from 2012 to 2013 and actually see if that is indeed the case. And I just wanted to point out really quickly here that you know in 2014 we're gonna have Mississippi that's gonna be part of this project too. So we're gonna have another location whereby we're actually gonna have both F36 and Africa applied so to get a much better picture. I have some questions. First of all, do you remember where this F36 came from? From, take from uh, Arizona, from the cotton field. So that's what you talk about in Georgia, Alabama, and North Carolina. Second question is that. Uh, second one is that uh, uh, you, you, you did uh, the trade application, after application, at Harvest 2012. Do you have any numbers? Yeah, that's what I was trying to say. You know, we'll have a, a good picture. We have, we have the data right now. We're still, you know, collect, we're still working on the samples. We'll have yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, you didn't, yeah, that's I didn't show that. Yeah, yeah, I didn't show that. Well, thank you. Any other questions? Now, did you pick up any other strains in doing your testing you think would be uh, an atoxygenic strain in the future? Can you come again? Can you pick up the that you might think would prevent aflatoxin in the future? Yeah, we are, what we're trying to do is that based on these uh, studies, you know, we, uh, we also have connecting you know, uh, uh, isolates that we think are potential based on kind of the signatures that have been developed by Bruce Hall and Ignacio Carbon. And we are, we are also going to be testing those to see uh, whether we can use that information to predict you know, uh, in what areas a certain you know, biocontrol, I mean, atoxygenic strain might like to be a very good candidate. We're doing that here. Yeah. So we have, so far we already, we only have three, you know, that we have come up with. So. I got one question. Okay. Do you have any indication as to how far, how far sporulation drifts beyond the target? Well, well that, that's a very really good question. <laughs> uh, the, the reason why I'm saying that, I'm not smiling because we, we, sent, we, sent, we, sent, we did send a paper to uh, biological control, and uh, one of the uh, the uh, the editor, the senior editor in chief, the senior editor actually said that you are, the biocontrol was very close to uh, was very far away because we know how far it can move. You know, so uh, the uh, the untreated plot was about uh, eight kilometers away. Okay, so we have uh, uh, what we call. Uh, uh, a segregated design you know, because basically you're trying to minimize uh, the type 2 sum of square because of the distance. But of course, in those two locations, you don't know what's happening in the soil. You know, um, and, but at the same time, if you bring them together, you know, you cannot really tell what's happening. So because you know these guys can move, and, and so you have to have a compromise between the distance and sort of making the viewers happy. But we know it can move very far. It's airborne and so all over the place. And so these are questions that we are. Uh, uh, confronted with the reviewers when you submitted the sponsors, but to me, I, I think having it an isolated event about 10 kilometers away, uh, the only problem with that is that you cannot co control what is within the treated and untreated. So if you really see toxin reduction uh, in the soil in, in the untreated, can you really tell is it because of what was not there in the, in the treated plot or not? So it, it's just very hard to really tell. That's a very good question.